Stand, stand with us. This is the word of the Lord. We honor it special in this place. It is our lifeline, our hope, and our salvation. We love God and we love God's word. So this morning, our message is based on this text. And I read it in your hearing from John's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Preaching to you this morning on sending Jesus an invitation. Because this event I'm preaching about today is by invitation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these that have gathered on this last Sunday of 2015. Thank you that there is life and life and hope and salvation. We bless you for it. We thank you that we have a chance to explore your word today one more time. We pray that somebody is open. Somebody here shall truly hear, and the Lord shall indeed be magnified through this word. Love you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. There can be a wonderful call that speaks about our demeanor in that hour. And there's a sense of strength that flourishes in the inner being of anybody who lives in intimate contact with Jesus Christ. The important question is, Can I come into this kind of an experience? Or somebody else would want to ask, have I come into this experience yet? I simply advise you, it can only happen as a result of Christ becoming the center of your life. 
You know how what we used to call the sprocket of a wheel and all the spokes all led into that same place so that your bicycle or tricycle or whatever you were riding back then was able to function aright. I want you to see that when you make Jesus the center of your life, everything else will function in the way it was intended to do so. It's, it's, it's like a passion that is able to drive everything else out of your life. Everybody knows that when you get something to really focus on, it seems to make a difference in everything else in your life. Here's a boy that mom and dad and everybody else couldn't get him to get out the bed, had a hard time getting him to take a bath, even worse time having him putting on something make him smell a little better. Pants sagging round down near his knees, and he just satisfied doing little or nothing. But some little sister comes along, gets his attention, He'll take a bath, put him on a little good smelling stuff, pull them pants up, come on, come on. Huh? And, and everything just seems to change. He's found somebody to focus on, and it draws out of him amazing things. I, I want you to know when Jesus becomes the center of a person's life, it seems to make a whole lot of other stuff fall off. Things that you used to squirm and have to wrestle with that frustrated you no end. When, when you get such a passion inside of you, all that other stuff seems to lose all of its attraction. And you're able to live at a level and in a way that you hardly thought possible before. The only problem with all of that is that Christ does not automatically become the center of our lives. Even for those of you who have confessed a hope in Christ. In fact, our Lord never moves to the center of anybody's inner world without a wholehearted invitation on the part of that individual. He will actually wait for our invitation. He has made it an important prerequisite. But if you first invite him into your heart and then you invite him to be the center of your life. I want you to know something going to happen for as you are concerned. I don't care how slow you move or how confused you feel like you are. Jesus will only occupy the center of your life when you make and extend to him the right invitation. Let me get to this. In the text, follow it with me here now. Um, here is Christ. These are uh, these moments that are a real trial for uh, his disciples. Um, Jesus uh, has announced to them that he will be leaving. And Thomas, Thomas, uh, always the questioning one, every group uh, will always have somebody Faith does not come easy. They are filled with questions, but in God's plan, they perform a, a wonderful role. And sure enough, here's Thomas uh, again uh, exhibiting this uh, uh, particular aspect of his personality. And he's listening to Jesus make all these mar marvelous statements here uh, about, uh, I'm going away, but listen, when I go away, I'm, I'm getting ready to fix up some mansions 
Christians, every one of you all got a wonderful future in front of you. And he says, you, you know uh, where I'm going and you know how to get there. But, but, but Thomas isn't like some of you all who sit up and nod your head and have no idea what the person's talking about. Thomas is one of those kind who just says, uh, a question needs to be asked right through here. Lord, we, 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 we don't even know where you're going. And how in the world are we going to know the way there? If you don't know where you're going, it's hard to choose how to get there. So, so Jesus, you got to do a little better than what you're doing here for us because I don't understand at all. Uh, what's going on. And, 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 and as a result, as a result, uh, this question being raised on the part of, of Thomas here, uh, here, uh, and, and he declares that, well, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? But Jesus here gives to him one of the most amazing responses you'll find anyway in Scripture. The Lord actually here positions himself as the center for all human living. Plainly and simply, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. What does that mean? How does that break down for us? I believe in this response to Thomas, Christ does not point Thomas to a way, he claimed to be the way. And without him, he was making it plain that the distance between God and man is an unbridgeable distance. He is saying here, I am the truth. So without me, there is an incredible ignorance on the part of man as far as God is concerned. He's plainly saying that life without him, there could be no genuine quality and worthwhileness to a man's life unless Jesus is in it. Oh, he's, he's saying something powerful to Thomas here. He's saying, Thomas, I, I, I am the center for everything. Somebody wrote a song and said, he is the way. Without him, there is no going. He is the truth. Without him, there is no knowing. He is the life now and eternity long. Uh, the, the, the songwriter is on to something. He grasps something of what is happening in this exchange between Jesus here and his disciples. So for us today, in, in, in this complex, confusing world that we're a part of, Jesus is saying to us, I must be in all the details of your human journey. Yeah. You, you, you can't call me in and, and say, look here, Lord, I want you to uh, fix this thing for me. And if you'll see, be so gracious as to take care of it, I, I, I'm not going to really bother you much anymore. After that, I can handle things for myself. But Jesus is saying, you don't understand life or your relationship to me. You can't call me in for something special. There are folks that we need for certain things. But Mike, I needed something with the computers this week, didn't I? All right? And who helped me with them? Okay, and you ain't been back since. Huh? Yeah, he did a good job. Help me out. Got done just what I wanted him to do. All right? And I haven't called on him. I'm bothered or worried. Where's Brother Mike? Is he coming back again today? No. He did what I wanted him to do, and I'm satisfied now. It happens all the time. Others of you that are here, you're good specialists in certain things. We learn to live our lives that way. We operate like that. You know, I need something done, and somebody has to do it. Um, who was it? Uh, my, my, my children this week, we were talking about uh, Brother John had, had, had uh, come and, and uh, installed a new dishwasher for us. And, and my kids from Columbus said, well, you know, we need a John Reed in, in, in Columbus. 
uh, you know, somebody, when we need him, we can call on him. He just seems to be able to fix and do all kinds of things. Uh, it's good to have these kinds of folk who can help you in these kinds of ways. Uh, I know now, if my foot is hurting, I don't call on Brother Isaiah at that end. But if my head needs trimming, I look out for Brother Isaiah Thomas, right? Uh, Isaiah, Tom, Isaiah Townsend, who can get a job done, you see, for those special thing. I'm trying to contrast for you. You cannot bring that principle or idea into the realm of dealing with Christ. He doesn't come in and fix up this thing or that thing. He's trying to say to Thomas and to tell us everything that involves your life, I'm to be right at the heart and the center of it. You don't get to pick and choose. Some folk come to church, oh, you know, I'm just not feeling good in my body. So, Pastor, I want you to pray for me, and I need the Lord to help me. Well, where were you yesterday when you were dealing with other things in your life? You weren't looking for the preacher nor Jesus. Uh, you decided you'd handle it your own way and in your own time. Uh, the Lord is saying, you don't understand what it means for me to really be in your life. For me to be there, I need to be the center of your life. Everything needs... Uh, to come not only before me, but be in contact with me, I will be there and be central to it all. Uh, uh, it's so key for us to understand this. Um, it, it's important. He wants to be in all of the details of our life. Uh, Christ's solution. There are three things quick I want to say to you today for you to understand going into this new year what's necessary on our part. Uh, number one, this is Christ's solution. Uh, it's called centered living. Uh, I want you to see it for what it uh, really means in the life of, of, of a believer. Uh, everything hangs together, and Christ is that hub that integrates every area of our lives. Uh, you see, Christ wants in on everything, uh, everything that involves you. Uh, that's the way it ought to be. Uh, I can remember back in civil rights days, and uh, at that time, I would remember I was the uh, NAACP president, and we we, we had some things going on and uh, we had asked uh, the community concerning them, politicians and others in, in select positions that we had worked with and we're trying and, and we got some things accomplished. I still remember in the early 70s, we passed the best fair housing law in the whole country right here in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, now mind you, uh, it was called in referendum and the, the, the folks voted it down uh, afterwards, but at that point we had a marvelous accomplishment. And I remember sitting down at the table with uh, these uh, uh, power brokers and decision makers and, and, and they were so happy that that was one of a list of, uh, of things. And they said, okay, are you all satisfied now? We said, no. They said, what do you mean? Uh, they said, well, 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 we've done this and we've done that and we've done the other. Aren't you all uh, satisfied now? Well, well, one of the brothers spoke up and said, listen, you have shared with us these things that we desired. Uh, but listen, he said, because uh, you know, they had asked, well, what do you really want? He said, we want some of everything you got. And said, if you get anything else, then we want some of that too. Well, we're just not going to be satisfied with things being better. We want everything to be uh, so involved. Now you're understanding what it would mean uh, and what Christ is saying in this text of Scripture for us. So he, he said, anything uh, that involves your life uh, and your decision making, uh, he said, I want to be in it. At home, I want to be in it. At church, I want to be in it. If you're at work, I want to be in it. If you're at school, uh, you cannot please me, he said, uh, if you leave me out of any area of your life. Um, in all these places, uh, Christ says you are to make him first and foremost in order to please him. Uh, it was Mother Teresa that, I believe, uh, had this interesting concept that can be workable for every Christian. Uh, she says, Christ is the way to be walked. He is the truth 
to be told, and he is the life to be lived. He unifies every aspect of our being around himself. Uh, this is the centered life at its best, according to the command and request of Christ. Secondly, not only uh, uh, is centered living uh, that which the Lord desires, but understand this, centering means a single focus. A single focus. Centering your life in Christ, to be honest with you, is not easy. But neither is it as complicated as some folk try to make it. You see, life can be simplified around Christ as the hub of everything else. Explorers know the value and the importance of a compass, all right? Why? Because a compass is magnetically drawn to the North Pole. I, I don't care what you do with a compass. Throw it up in the air and catch it. Spin it around a dozen times. Uh, but when it settles down, we all know it's going to be pointing north. That's what makes it a compass, you see. I want you to see in like fashion, God creates a compass in the depth of each of us that will magnetically draw us to Christ. Um, you see, we, we, we live in an age of disconnectedness. Um, uh, folks, folks are always disconnecting us. Uh, people will, uh, what do you call it on, on, on Facebook? They unfriend you. Uh, and uh, I know folk get all upset uh, about somebody doing that as far as they are concerned. Uh, but, but it's just part of how we live today. Everybody wants their space. Um, having uh, your own space is a given. Uh, even the children want, want their space uh, and don't want anybody invading it. Uh, there was a time when families, when, when your parents took you to certain places. Nowadays, kids say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, you, 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 you linger back a little bit and let me go in here. I don't want my friends to see me with my parents as though there was something wrong with you being seen with your parents. Uh, we, 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 we just have this space thing that says, uh, I gotta be able to think and operate and function on my own. Uh, 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 centering though on Christ is the thing though that will help you to be able to get things in order. It, it, it gives you a handle on everything, a focus around which to organize everything else. Centering makes life's journey really meaningful and fulfilling for us. So that's why I want to invite you to center on Jesus Christ. It will normalize your life by allowing Christ into all areas of your life. You will have a spiritual perspective that will shape your thoughts. It will monitor, uh, monitor your conversations. It will question your attitudes and evaluate your achievements. Christ is intended to be Alpha, but it's also intended to be Omega and everything in between. Now, I, I, I want to get it across to somebody today. You've got to learn how to center on Christ. Uh, it's like when you center on Christ, it's uh, like uh, what, what gravity is to the universe. It, it's, it's like what the North Star is to a navigator. It's what radar means to a plane pilot. It's what oxygen means to the lungs of a man. It's like the CEO, uh, what he means to a business. It's what a gearbox is to a transmission. It's what a linchpin is to an axle, you see. It's what mission control is to an astronaut. You see, without it, all else uh, has no real uh, uh, connectedness or bearing unless Jesus is at the center of it all. Uh, 
I want you to see that when you put him at the center, life begins to come together. Some of y'all are just going every which way and not sure even now which way you are headed. Uh, but I want to say to you, when you start living the Christ-centered life, uh, it sorts out the difference between what ought to be at the heart of things and what ought to be put out on the periphery of your life. Uh, what is temporary and what is permanent. Uh, what is just passing for the moment and what is eternal in the plans of God. Uh, Paul, Paul understood this. No wonder when he was really wanting to testify, he said to those uh, who he was writing to, this one thing I do. How many things you got to do today? 10, all right. How many you got to do? 20, all right, good. Uh, really, he, he busy, folk dying all the time. He got to see about all kind of folk, every kind of which way. Uh, and mind you, you appreciate him because everybody don't care, take care of your lost ones uh, and your, 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 your loved ones uh, like they does. That's a commercial. You give me a little offering afterwards, okay. But with all there is that involves our lives, you've got to have something that becomes the center and the focus and enables you. This one thing I do, forgetting or pushing back to second place is everything else. Uh, and Paul grasped that. Uh, he, he had to forget everything that was behind and press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, so centering means a single focus for your life. Thirdly, centering shifts the focus from self to Christ. You get that? The Bible teaches that the outside always reflects what's on the inside. Logic then tells us that if we fix up the inside, the outside will take care of itself. Centering begins uh, with, with a determined commitment to, to, to give careful attention to the inner issues of motive and intention, and less attention to appearances, images, and impressions. This is key for people to understand. Some of you all are saying, Pastor, kind of heavy today. Yes, it is heavy. I, I want you to think and follow me, because most people have conflicting commitments. And no matter how small the co conflict may be, it can still generate a mess in your lives. The conflict between our inner world and our outer world can wreck the quality of your living. You've got to get the two together. I, I'm a, a, a fan, you all know that, uh, uh, of the comics. Some of them can teach some wonderful lessons. And one of the uh, favorite people of mine uh, has always been the Peanuts uh, comic strip, okay? Any of the rest of y'all like Peanuts? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, the comic strip Peanuts. All right. Um, well, here's one of their classic ones. I, 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 I really like it. And, and even though Charles, what's his name, is deceased now, um, he, they, they're doing a repeat of all of them because there's so much good wisdom. Uh, that's why the Charlie Brown Christmas the other night had so much spiritual stuff in it because actually um, the, the, the creator of that was a good churchman, a good Christian. He actually was a part of our church, out on, a church of God out on the West Coast and, and was one of my young days, was one of the real celebrities in the life of the church. Well, anyhow, um, his insight was just wonderful, and uh, this, this one here is the one that blessed me so well. Uh, it, it's, it's Lucy and Charlie Brown um, playing baseball, and, and um, the, the Charlie Brown's the pitcher, and he makes the pitch, and the batter uh, hits a, a, a high fly towards center field, and, and that's where Lucy is. And Lucy uh, 
puts herself seemingly in position to be able to catch the ball. But for some reason, she doesn't catch it, and it falls right beside her. And, and the man makes a, a, a home run. And so uh, she decides to call timeout, and she walks all the way into the mound and, and uh, says uh, to Charlie Brown, you saw me miss that ball. And I want to explain to you why. She said, my body doesn't seem to want to do what my brain tells it to do. And she's ready to go on, but Charlie Brown stops her. And he says to her, I understand exactly what you are saying. He says, my body and my brain haven't spoken to each other in years. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, a, it's an accurate description of what uncentered living is like. Fragmentation happens in our lives. Uh, and, and we almost literally have a civil war between our body, our soul, and our brain. Really, it, it amounts to a war of the soul. Um, every interest uh, in, 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 inside of you uh, will insist on having its own way. In the Bible, the Bible, this is not a new problem. It's always been with humankind. And, and, and the Bible calls such uncentered living, it says that man is a double-minded man. You know, a lot of you hear that phrase. What does it mean? This is what it means. You have no real center of your life. Nothing that dominates over everything else. Whatever desire, whatever comes up, you got to wrestle and deal with it because there's nothing where on, on which you are so focused uh, that it will prevail over everything else. So you, that's what gives temptation its power because there is no central deciding factor, no umpire in your life that makes the decisions and you've committed to go along with all of them. So the devil comes with certain things and there you go. Uh, why? Because this focus is not on a central umpire that makes decisions and settles everything else. So one time you wrestle with it uh, and you come out victorious. Oh, thank the Lord. The next time the same temptation comes and you fall in the face of it. Your problem is it depends on how you happen to feel that day. That, that there are some times, you know, that, that, that a sexual temptation can come. And, and uh, you can look that devil in the eye and say, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, but but uh, the next time that, that it happens, uh, your, your hormones ain't, ain't, ain't in harmony quite the right way. Things are stirred up inside of you, and you say, well, why fight it? I can repent, and the Lord will forgive me next time. Why, why does this keep happening to believers? It happens because you have no centered life where somebody is an umpire who always makes the decisions. I, I was, what well, me and my son were watching, and um, who was that in that game? Indiana, whoever they were playing yesterday. Who was it? Brother Ed, who was it? Indiana was playing in the bowl game yesterday. Oh, it was Duke. Yeah, that's right. It was Duke. And uh, did any of you all see that game at the end of it? Huh? Yeah. Half a dozen, six, eight, ten, eight. Yeah. You see what happened? The boy kicks the ball for a field goal, which would have tied the score and given them a chance to win. But the umpire does what? No good. The boy runs down there, the kicker, wait a minute, and in the replay, it looks like it's good, right? All right, me and Brother Mike, we, we'll get together on this one. All right. But somebody decides Whatever the umpire says, there's no review. The game is over. That poor kicker for Indiana, he's still crying. Can you hear him? He's still crying. But what was the problem? Before the game started, 
both teams agree that this man will have the final deciding power. You, you, you've given up your right. Whatever he says, that's what's going to be. And that was it. The game was over. The coach ran over to the umpire. What did he say? So the umpire said, no good, that's it. He told his team, come on. Leave the, don't be out here protesting. Don't be out here carrying on. Because what we've agreed to is what we're going to live by. Jesus wants to be the umpire in your life. He has the final say about everything. I don't care what your mama says, Jesus has the final authority. I don't care what your feelings are telling you, Jesus has the final authority. When we understand that, there comes a consistency into our lives that's marvelous. We just don't like it that way. I know preachers who don't like it that way. When I was a youngster, I, I um, was pastoring in Illinois, and I, uh, well, Chuck, I'm taking my coat off. He told me, don't get too hot and be falling out like last week. He said, take your coat off when you begin to feel warm. And they nominated, I, I was nominated to be the um, vice chairman of the Maybe the chairman of the assembly in the state of Illinois for Church of God. And I'm just a kid, about 27, 28 years of age. And um, so we have this state convention, and the vote is taken. And uh, uh, lo and behold, um, they say we can't uh, complete the count in the elections here now, we'll notify you how it turns out. So a couple of days later, my phone rings, and the chairman of the committee, a wonderful uh, old brother in the Lord, Thomas Walker was his name, uh, Leroy's daddy, a wonderful man of God, pastor in Chicago and all. He says to me, Pastor Cuff, I'm so sorry, I have to tell you that you lost the election. And so uh, I, I said, uh, oh, it's okay. Um, the brother who won the election is my friend. I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. But a strange thing happened. I started getting calls from uh, a few other preachers, and they said, uh, we were on that ballot counting committee, and uh, you actually had more votes than the other man did. I said, I did? Okay. So I got on the phone, I called the state chairman who was uh, still the state chairman then, and I said, um, is it possible uh, for there to be a recount of the votes from that election? And uh, he said, uh, no, uh, it's really not possible. So I said, okay, but something wouldn't let me rest. So I called Brother Walker, the chairman of the committee. I said, Brother Walker, uh, some of your committee members say that the announcement the state chairman made was not correct. Um, he said, well, uh, I, I'll have to pray about that. I said, well, you were the chairman of the committee. Why don't you call your committee together and just uh, count the ballots one more time? Uh, he, this phone got a little silent. And I said, can you answer that question? Well, I realized then he was crying. He said, no. He said, the chairman took the ballots away from me and it burned them all up. We can't recount that election anymore. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. But then the Lord just said to me, you've agreed to be a part of an assembly and there are people in charge. You hear me? There are people that are in charge and they made that decision. Now, you don't let it spoil your joy or mess with you. The Lord will work this whole thing out. And in the end, when it was over, I won't tell you the whole story, but the man who was elected, according to the chairperson, as the chairman, 
his very, what's going to call his ministry. He became one of the great men. He's gone on to be with the Lord now in the life of the work of God. Um, and, and yet, God had to help me to see that when you submit to an authority bigger than you are, whether you like the results or not, you abide by it because God will make everything work out all right. God, I had to learn that lesson as a youngster that you can't just want everything to go your way. You have to submit to how the Lord would have it. Let me wrap up what I'm trying to say to you here. Um, that that you, 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 you have to see that the, what the Bible calls being double-minded uh, is never acceptable for the saints of God. You've got to be able to shift the focus from yourself to Christ. He is in charge. He is the Lord of your life. He is uh, the one who makes the decisions far as you are concerned. Not what pleases me, it's what pleases him. We get used to it in life. My, my family sent me to the store to get some things yesterday. And uh, I, I knew what to get, uh, but my wife had made a general request. And I came home um, with a whole big, how many was there, a hundred? Uh, a big old thing of shrimp. She said, shrimp, this ain't what I asked for. I said, no, but it's what I wanted. <laughs> now, now, I want you to know, we can insist on our way. You know where that shrimp is right now? It, it, it's in my refrigerator <laughs> in the church, you know, because that was my decision. The problem is, is that we don't just do that about something to eat. We do that with our life. What do I like? What would please me? What fits in with the way I want things to go? And, and, and we, that, that's why churches are in such turmoil, having conflict and strife and arguments, dividing and, and all, because we have not decided only Christ makes decisions in this place. Well, I got a mind of my own. That mind is supposed to be submitted to the Lordship of Christ. And when that happens, when that happens, an amazing thing happens in the lives of, 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 of people. We come together. Without it, it's like holding a group meeting with no chairman. Everybody makes their own decisions. They make their own demands, their own requests. They may be in conflict. They may be divisive, but we want it our way. It leads to anarchy, and it'll cause you one moment to fight like a soldier and the next moment to be crying like a two-year-old. I tell you, divisions like this within us, um, it cripples our faith harms our future, and destroys our relationships. Uh, it's key for us to remember this truth. When somebody is constantly saying, I'm confused, uh, it usually means there's an internal confusion that's created fragmentation in their life. But when he who is the true center of life is allowed to coordinate all the facets of who we are and who we want to become, it makes all the difference in the world. For your mind to get straightened out, you've got to have a fixed center, a fixed point, or you will be pulled in several directions at the same time. That's what double-mindedness is really all about. But all when you get it together, and I wrap it up here, when the op, you'll find the obvious benefit of a truly integrated life is intimacy with Jesus Christ. So it's an intimacy that motivates the details of our life and work. He must become what one author called the master of ceremonies in our lives. He becomes the holy whisperer that gives us direction. He is the divine taproot that supplies all the life and nourishment we need. He's the heavenly monitor. He is the inner.
presence that trades his nearness for all that loneliness uh, that would overwhelm you. He is the satisfying center that deals with our fear of the future. He is an eternal now that is with us both now and forevermore. Well, Christ is the hub of our activity. He's the magnet around which all decisions are made. Uh, he will deal with every aspect of our lives. Uh, he'll take everything and blend it uh, into a useful divine purpose. Uh, he'll take your smiles uh, along with your tears. Uh, he'll take your fun as, long, as well as your fears. Uh, he'll be with you at the picnics of life and he'll be with you at the funeral of your most and best loved one. Uh, he'll be in your play. He'll be in your work. Uh, he'll be in your prayer times. He'll be with you every step of the way. Uh, that's when, that's when uh, you'll be able to take him into the whole uh, of your entire life. Uh, take him to work, Jesus is Lord there. Uh, take him at, at home and in, in, in your marriage uh, and you'll find he works there. Uh, you don't have to stop off at the tavern on the corner and get a little courage imbibed in so you can face the confusion in your house. Uh, if you take Jesus with you when you go to work, he'll be with you when you get back home. Uh, I tell you, he'll go to school He'll go shopping with some of you all. Uh, he'll go to court with some others of you. Uh, that's who this Jesus really is. Uh, he is the center of our lives. Uh, your children are not the center of your life. Your mate is not the center of your life. Your job is not the center of your life. Your small pleasures are not the center of your life. Not even your friends uh, can be the center of your life. Uh, all of these were ultimately fail you uh, and disappoint you. Uh, oh, you're working to get a little money, uh, but your fortune can easily be lost. Uh, your career can be destroyed. Uh, your education becomes outdated. Uh, your relationships will get fractured uh, by death divorce uh, or just desertion on your friend's part. Uh, everything else is temporary, church. Uh, there's only one who is permanent in the lives of his children. Uh, uh, learn his name. Uh, get close to him uh, and know that when you relate to him, he'll take care of business for you. Uh, make him the center of all your living uh, and your life will not only be simple, but it will be satisfying. Uh, you don't have to be afraid of life when Jesus is in charge. You don't have to be afraid of death when Jesus is in charge. You don't have to worry about your past when Jesus is in charge. And God knows, uh, put your future in his hands and everything will be all right. Uh, who was it? Richard Smallwood who said, Jesus is the center of my joy. He not only produces joy, but he'll bring peace and love and genuine satisfaction. If you invite him, he'll come in. Bow your heads if you would. Somebody this morning 